Good morning to you. Actually, I would say this is one of the most beautiful days we have spent here in Copenhagen. The sun is out, everything is lovely, and this is the last day of this magnificent and lovely gathering. So I think today we ha will have great and amazing program that will equip us with whatever necessary to go back home and to continue the mission. So you are most welcome to this beautiful and magnificent panel that we are going to start right now on very important concept. Future, innovation, creativity. You know this beautiful terminology, the future. I remember when I was in Africa in 1997 reporting from South Africa and from the Congo and from many other parts of Africa, I used to have this massive camera, which was like about 35 kilograms on my, not my shoulder, actually, my cameraman's shoulder. And we used to have these huge editing suites, you know, to make the story and to feed it through massive equipments and satellites to our headquarters in Doha at that time with Al Jazeera network. Then slowly, slowly, I found that there is a new thing emerging, something they call mini DV cameras, something they call Final Cut Pro on Mac, and so on and so forth, and we used it. In five years, that technology almost disappeared from the field, and something new, fresh, cheap, dynamic emerged. We used it, and we became much more dynamic, and we moved more, and we saved money more, and we became great communicators. Later on, with just a few years later, something else emerged, social networks. At that time, we used to call it a new media. Now it's not new anymore. Social networks, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, everything else. And suddenly, we are in front of a new phase of, of, of media evol evolution, which citizen journalism introduced to us another access to the societies that we are reporting from. And suddenly, you know, every human being equipped with a smartphone was able to become a reporter. And we, traditional reporters, I would say, we're not easy about it because these new kids are really challenging us and giving us something different that we have been trained, we studied, we did a lot of a great job, we suffered a lot to achieve, and now we are challenged by these new, you know, young, comers to the scene. Uh, of course, that is not anymore the case because they have become the players on the scene. Now, the future for me is on two major fronts. Number one is going to be much more globalized than any human being ever imagined before us. The amount of globalized tools, visions, values, and networks that we are going to see in the next 10 years will change every established thought that we have had about the concept of organization or about the concept of specificity or the concept of identity or even the concept of culture. Therefore, take note of that. We are moving towards massively, you know, interconnected, globalized, world. That's number one. Number two, I think technology will change us, not only our medium or context. With nanotechnology, with biotechnology, with artificial intelligence, if you read the projections for the next 20 years, as I am recently trying to understand what's going to happen, you will find that not only our societies will change, our modes of communication will change, but we as humans might change even. We internally might, even biologically might change. Our nanotechnology and biotechnology will go deep into us, and that becomes something else as well that we are going to address in the future. In short, the future is, is something amazing. It's completely different. New challenges needs new psychology, and it needs a new mentality. And most importantly, it needs a new narrative to tell. And since we are advocating the rights of women and young girls, how that future will impact on us. How are we going to rehabilitate our narrative and introduce a new approach to reality that might survive the challenge of time? And in my opinion, it is the biggest departure of the traditional modes of communication since the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. 
Anyway, I would actually first start with Pam. Wow. Pam Scott. How do I follow that? <laughs> you are the greatest, wow. you know, I mean, <laughs> in this field. You know, I have been advocating always in media something called human-centered paradigm. Hmm. And today, I was thrilled, of course, to read about your concept of human-centered design. Hmm. I am really, really happy to hear this terminology again. And I would like you to introduce to us this concept and the answer to the question in front of us. Well, Please. great. Well, I wish it was my concept. I have to give credit to a lot of designers that came before me, but um, IDEO is probably best known as the people who've coined the phrase and have really put the practice out into the universe. But basically what human-centered design is, is that we put the people we're trying to influence at the very center of our creative process. And I believe that communication, whether we're advocating for women and girls or anything else, is about influence. I know that might sound a little bit crass, but basically, when you're communicating with someone, you're trying to get them to think or do or feel something they're not currently thinking, doing, or feeling. And I also believe that it's almost impossible to do that effectively if you don't know who they are, and if you don't understand them, and if you don't respect them. And so when we talk about all this technology and how we're gonna be so globally connected, I get a little worried, to be perfectly honest because I think great communication starts with understanding each other and starts with having empathy for each other. And I've seen a bit of a bad habit, so I worked in the commercial sector for a number of decades, too, and then I transferred over to the social sector, went from the dark side to the good side, and I'd say that I, see a bad, I saw a bad habit in the commercial sector that I also see in the social sector, and that is that often we get a little comfortable speaking on behalf of other people, people with whom we have a rather distant relationship. And I can tell you that there is danger in that distance. Because when we are advocating for women and girls, it's too easy to be distant from the people who don't feel like us and to cast them as bad people. And I tell you, I learned an incredible lesson from this man named Brian Stevenson as my social uh, social sector crush. He's a man who works on behalf of people who are innocent but incarcerated in our vast prison system in the United States. And as you might imagine, most of the people who are wrongly incarcerated in the United States are men of color, underprivileged men of color. And Brian is himself a man of color and people have come at him people who hold terrifically racist views in my country have not only tried to discredit his wor work, but also threatened his life. And when I asked Brian, how do you deal with people who come at you with such hate and hold such different belief, beliefs as your own? And he said, with all the grace that he has, I learned a long time ago, they're not bad people. They've just been taught a lie. And when I think about the people who stand in the way of girls and their greatest potential, and women and all the progress that they deserve, they're not bad people. They've just been taught a lie. And I think our job is to connect with them face to face, shoulder to shoulder, understand the lie that they've been taught, and really know them as human beings and what they care about, and create communication that is empathetic to their point of view, even if it is terrifically different from our own. To meet them where they are, to speak with them respectfully. Molly Melching, who fights a number of battles, but one of them is against genital mutilation, said, aggression doesn't lead to effectiveness. I think it all starts with empathy. I think we can communicate with people effectively and bring them to, over to our side when we understand better who they are as human beings. Thank you. This is great. Beautiful. Thank you. This is magic. Uh, now, Raj Kumar, uh, solution-based journalism. I love, and I think journalism, I love it immediately. So <laughs> the concept is interesting. You are the editor-in-chief and the founding president of DevEx and you are involved of introducing DevX as a platform for social development, uh, you know, uh, organizations and community. Now, how do you see this future and what could we do in order to match the challenges of this future? 
Well, with, uh, you were talking about uh, nanotechnology and this technological vision of the future, and I was thinking about Google Glass. Mm. I'm curious, has anybody here actually tried Google Glass? Mm. Few yes. hands. I had a chance to try it myself. It is a very strange feeling, obviously. You know, it's got its flaws as a product, but it gives you a, a window into the future. You're wearing these glasses, and you can, you know, see the internet, and you can sort of talk to yourself in a low voice, and, and you get a feeling of power. The thing I don't think it does, though, that technology, or maybe one day we'll all have a chip in the back of our head or something no. to communicate with us. <laughs> but the thing I don't think that technology will do is erase the lie. Mm. And that is the fundamental issue here, mm. right? So there have been so many fantastic discussions in this, in this conference, and often we're talking about symptoms. We're talking about the grim statistics of women in schools, girls in schools, of gender-based violence. But really, there's an underlying issue, which is the rights of women and girls. Yeah. And it's, the, it's these lies which exist in every society in the world. The question when we think about communications, when we think of what is this future, is how do we get at those core issues? And too often, I think, when we think of communications, we look at it as a, a simple technocratic practice. So lots of people come to us at DevX and talk about, well, we, we want to do a campaign, we want to reach X million people. You know, they think about numbers in that sense, as opposed to maybe if we just reached one, mm. but we really changed them, what would that mean? All right, so we need to get past the broad concept of communicating as just something you do. It's just, it's just a function in an organization. And to start thinking more about well, what are the <coughs> communications efforts that have actually changed the world? And we tend to refer to them as movements. You know, and you think about a movement in the United States like marriage equality. Just the language around that has been very different and moved the entire country. Nobody thought the United States would have legal, equal marriage for all Americans. That it, was, it was something we couldn't imagine just a decade ago. And we got there because that movement got to the core issues. And I think a critical element of that movement is it was led by the people who were affected by it. And as we think about movements for the rights of women and girls around the world, it will be led by women and girls. So one of the things we try to do at DevX when we think about our own journalism is to say, can we ensure that we don't fall into a, a very common trap, which is to think of women and girls as beneficiaries or victims? To think of them as someone we're in this development and health community, we're, they're, they're someone we're doing something to with good intentions. But actually, the underlying idea that's so critical is that women and girls, they will be the agents of their own change. When the world changes, it will, be, it will come from them. <laughs> and we're here to support that. We have critical roles to play in, in, with the many different hats that we all wear in, in this diverse audience. But in the end, it's going to come from them. And so we need to think of our movements that we create and the communications that we support in that frame. And very often, that is not the way we talk about these issues, unfortunately. Okay. Good. Great. Thank you. This is beautiful. You know, just to make you laugh a little bit, a few days ago, I was listening to a lecture by a professor called Michu Kaku. He's a very famous sure. uh, physician, a theoretical physician. And he was talking about not actually Google, Google Glass. He's talking about the lens that will be on your eye. And through it, you will be seeing everything connected, of course, to the internet. And therefore, your eye will become the computer itself. And oh. therefore, you will be able to see everyone and mark him and so on. And amongst the marketing tools he used, <laughs> interesting thing, he said, even your wife can connect any moment to your eye and see exactly what you are watching. <laughs> so maybe you can take a note of that. <laughs> now we move to um, Tambisa Fakudi, Tambisa from South Africa. You have been doing a lot of work in South Africa, in the Middle East, and you are a member of the Common Action Forum and the Jazeera Center for Studies. The narrative is important to be produced, polished, and dynamic enough to go through the future. And are you aware of what challenges we may face in this globalized, well-connected world that we are talking about? Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Kanfer. I think the, the intentions are well and good. And I think they should be encouraged because they're going to change the way we do things and see things in the future. For me, as a person coming from the global south, um, my only concern is the access to these modes of 
communication, which are by and large middle class and deprive those people who come from my communities of an opportunity to participate in the discourse, deprive the people who come from, from my community to cont contribute towards the policy making in that discourse. And that's the only fear I have, that as we move along and as we get technologically advanced, there are people in Africa, Asia, and uh, other regions of the world that are still struggling to access internet, for example that do not have computers. And those are the people that are affected by these uh, challenges that we're here today discussing, particularly women and girls. So as the discussion continues, I'm afraid that the majority of human beings on Earth, we're talking one point, I know there's a, there is a possibility of uh, the penetration of, of technology and the usage of internet, et cetera, but there are other logistical support that should be in place in order to facilitate the, the dialogue, and they are not existing in many, in many parts of the world. So that's my only challenge, uh, that the, 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 the globalization process and, this, and the discourse which uses the new forms or the new modes of communication are leaving a lot of people behind. I was one of the people who protested, for example, uh, and continue to argue that uh, United Nations Security Council, for example, should uh, include more people instead of restricting itself to the six uh, members with, with, with veto rights. Um, some of us in Africa have argued that even the Charter of United Nations Human Rights of 1945 was imposed on us, because many of us were not even part of that discussion, because it happened, number one, in New York, far away from Africa. We had to take the ship or boats to get to New York, which could have taken us three months way after the meeting. And the current discussion is, is exactly the same, that the people that are affected by these global challenges and social social political challenges that we have are not participating, are not part of this discussion. So I'm not, an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, but all I'm saying is that let us look at fast-tracking um, logistics and, and, and support these communities in order for them to be able to be participating, to be, to, to be full participators in, in the process. And I think we'll have a chance where they will all rubber stamp the whatever findings or conclusions we reach. Finally, there's also a temptation of monopolizing the language of communication. Yes, we all agree that English is the most important language, some of us speak it, but there's another language or other languages that are as prevalent in the world which we are uh, totally ignoring. Uh, we had a discussion earlier on about a, discussion, uh, about a couple of friends who visited us in Doha, Qatar, who came from China. And he shook my comfort zone by telling me that China has got 1.6 billion human beings. And they, speak, they don't speak English. And then you have uh, India with similar number of people. Uh, so what the decision in terms of what language you use in communicating our strategies and mobilizing, we need to also take that into consideration and, and, and try and change uh, if we can. Great, thank you, Tambisa. Mm -hmm. This is a very important issue that I would like Bam to, com to comment on it just in a second. You know, among the great lessons I've learned in Africa myself when I was a reporter was from a tribe called the Maasai. And I think you are aware of the Maasai mm -hmm. tribe, which is living somewhere between Tanzania <coughs> and, and Kenya. And the Maasai tribe is a huge tribe, it's not a small one. It is always in documentaries and, you know, cultural shows they are introduced for their colorful, traditional style. You know, they are tall, they dress in red, and they have these beautiful, you know, uh, piercings in their, in their ears and so on and so forth. I actually decided to study this tribe from within. Uh, and, and I did spend good time in the tribal area, living with them, eating with them in their huts, and doing a documentary about their, about their perception of existence, why are here, what is their, their mode of knowledge and so on. And then I discovered that behind this cultural media show that we are all of us interested to see about the Maasai, they have very deep cultural paradigm and strong religious concept of themselves and the world. Mm -hmm. And therefore they fit everything within that paradigm. 
And here, I will go back to you since you have been working a lot in Africa and you have been in many other parts of the world outside the Western globalized world. I would assume that among the challenges would be how to bring change into societies who have a solid paradigm of thinking. Yeah. And of course, I know that there are wrong practices, bad cultures, but would you suggest to us new tools that we could make things organic, going from within the society rather than being imposed on these societies? Yeah, I think absolutely right. So I spend most of my time uh, on work through the Maverick Collective working with PSI in Tanzania to overcome teen pregnancy. And while the Maasai have not been so focused on in this research, there are other aspects of that community or that country that we have focused on. And every community has their narrative, and a lot of those narratives aren't supporting women and girls. And I'll just give you an example. So what we are fighting for is for girls to have access to contraception that will keep them from having unintended teen pregnancies. And we know that uh, issues related to pregnancy is the second leading cause of death for girls 15 to 19 in the developing world. So you'd think a whole lot of people would want to be a part of these, uh, helping these girls not become pregnant. So again, we try not to cast people as bad people who are standing in the way of girls and contraception. And so we've spent a great deal of time understanding the community of medical providers, doctors, nurses, and pharmacy staff who are denying girls access to contraception. And I tell you, it'd be easy to cast them as bad guys, but you can't. When you go out into the villages and you meet them in Takawa or Dar es Salaam or Agoro, Bagamoyo, you find that they are good people who just happen to be something, doing something different from what you want them to do. And in this case, they've been told a lie, right? And the crazy thing is, in this particular case, you know who taught them that lie? We did. <laughs> we framed contraception as family planning. And when you do that, you suggest that someone who isn't planning a family, like a teen girl who's not married, is not welcome to it. And you serve it up at places that are family planning clinics and family planning outreach programs. And again, that indicates who is welcome and who is not welcome. We label it things like Familia, that's a brand name, again, family planning. And we have spent millions, if not billions, casting contraception as a tool for married women with children to space and limit their births. And that has roughly translated in Tanzanian society to mean contraception harms your fertility. And what is the greatest asset of an unmarried girl in Tanzania? Her fertility. No. So there's the lie we have told the medical community. And they are not bad people. They are operating under a lie that no longer serves them and no longer serves girls. So my team and I are working to do very precise, very strategic communication among the medical community to start unraveling that lie and give them a new truth. Inspire them to believe that a girl is actually safer on modern contraception than she is when she's at risk of becoming pregnant unintentionally. But we are doing this very respectfully Excellent. and we are meeting people where they are. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Now Raj, just to follow up on the same issue, you are an expert in communication. Would you, and you are, your argument about women and girls should be the agents themselves of the transformation. So the message communicated to the public and communicated to everyone. To what, what kind of advice are you giving to women and girls when they sit and design the message in order to produce themes and concepts and terminologies that might not clash with well-established understanding of, of people's roles and families and so on? I think the best messages are organic. They haven't really been designed necessarily mm. from the outside. But you take someone like Malala, who's coming out of her own community, her own experience, there's, everything is authentic about what, what, what she is and what she's built. And really the responsibility of those of us in the broader development community is to say, how do we find champions like her and support them? And they exist in every society, in every community. So it's, it's less about us going in with a plan to try to design something for someone else. It's more about us finding those champions and supporting them. And I think where, where we find those examples we see much greater success than, than elsewhere. So uh, another example from the United States is the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. 
And that's something which has grown up totally organically from people who are affected. Yes, they're using new communications tools. They're filming videos of things that are happening. They're using social media. That's all true. And it, is, it does change the nature of what they're doing and how they're doing it. But the fundamental fact is that it's organic. Nobody came in from the outside to design it. OK. Would you, in this case, suggest that we have universal values on the issues of women and girls? However, the contextualization of it and the framing of it should take into consideration, the terminology of it, even the method of it, should take the form of the society that we are addressing. I think so. And I think very often uh, we as a community here, and I'm speaking broadly, obviously it's a very diverse group of organizations and individuals represented here, but I think the, the key thing is to understand your communications objective and to say, well, who am I actually trying to influence? And very often at the kind of global level, what we're trying to do is we're trying to influence each other. Mm -hmm. And that is actually an important thing. Yeah. If we get ourselves on the same page on key issues, you brought up family planning as an example, where you say it's really our community, we have to get ourselves to understand what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be the case on so many other issues where it's critical to understand what are UN agencies saying? What are the major NGOs saying? What are the major funders saying? Are we, do we get it? And, and very often people in the local community, they of course get it, or that champion, that Malala in her own village gets it. But we as a global community need to be on the same page. And so very often I think when we, when we consider communications objectives, it's not just how many people did I reach, it's did I get to the key influencers within the institutions that are gonna actually shape the way we as a global community touch these issues. Okay, great, that's beautiful. Now, uh, Tambisa, of course I take your point about English becoming the lingua franca, basically, of this uh, globalized world. Uh, however, you still, you still believe that, you know, cultures, languages will continue to play a major role of understanding uh, each other and communicating. By the way, part of the famous lens that we are going to have, uh, <laughs> there will be a tool in it to translate in a way, you, I'm speaking to you in, let us assume, Arabic, you are speaking to me in Zulu, I will be able to immediately, this lens will, will, will tell me what you are talking. So maybe also technology, by the way, will also start out that. But until then, I think, yes, I will take your point. But what in this case would be your, your advice or your recommendation for someone who is trying to create real change in the world but at the same time, the, the, the pretext of cultural specificity, the tradition, and all these kind of issues is used to oppress women in certain circumstances, to create certain kind of discrimination, and to legalize it or legitimize it under the, co the cover of, of, of a tradition and culture. <clears throat> well, first of all, let me just be clear that I, I support the universal or universalization of women and girls' rights. That's very important. There should be a global consensus on, on, on the rights of, of girls and privileges of girls and women. But that discussion should be inclusive. We should be as inclusive as possible uh, in making sure that those universal rights and privileges that we will arrive at whenever it happens uh, took into consideration all this diversity that you are talking about. Uh, because I, I, I do believe that there are a lot of people who've got a lot to offer and much more urgent issues to bring to the table. Uh, uh, I studied uh, gender justice <clears throat> and one of the things we discussed in our classes was the new form of feminisms instead of feminism because, for example, women of, or women from the global south have got different social challenges compared to the uh, women from the global north. And the prioritization of those challenges at places where decisions are made, uh, certain of them take precedence depending who is more uh, who's more eloquent in bringing them up. And those women who come from the global south who cannot express themselves quick and efficient tend to have their grievances um, uh, deprioritized. So those are issues that are important. Uh, and, and towards this uh, uh, realization of uni universal universalization of women and girls' rights and privileges, we need to take into consideration uh, those issues. I used to be part of a South African civil society. We 
we used to go to certain uh, villages within South Africa and we'll find women expressing themselves in vernacular, raising really, really serious and painful issues. Then we organize national meetings, we bring them to national meetings and there will be others who eloquently express themselves in Queen's language and their voices get swallowed up. And then we rubber stamp the, the issues that were brought by those who were eloquent. And these women will go back to their buses, travel back home without the issues being raised. So that's the discussion I'm talking about. Uh, so, again, let me emphasize, I support universalization of women's rights and privileges, but the discussion should be inclusive and we should take into consideration the social impediments for women to express themselves in ensuring that their grievances are part of the agenda. And that's all I'm saying. Great. Now we, this is good work. Thank you, Tambisa. Uh, I think we have three minutes, three and a half minutes to finish. So I would like each one of you to conclude this panel with one sound bite. One sound bite that could summarize the essence of the future from your point of view. Please. Uh -huh. Oh, wait a minute. I'm catching up on my husband, seeing him in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good, yeah. um, let's see. I think the future is empathy. I think with all the technology that's coming on board that has already existed, we are at risk of losing our connectedness. And our connectedness is what will allow us to influence people who think differently from us. Our connectedness will allow us to have people feel empathetic to women and girls and will advocate on their behalf. We can't do this alone. I agree with you completely that we need to elevate the voices of girls and women but we also need men and boys believing in this cause as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But I'll, just, I'll just say it's interesting coming to an international conference like this as an American now because people come up to you and they find out you're American, they make a little bit of small talk, but you see in the back of their mind they're just desperate to ask you about Donald Trump. Oh. Desperate. <laughs> no! And well, all I'll say is that just like so many other issues we're talking about, in the end, if we frame this as well, these are American citizens. They may not have the same views that some of us espouse here. Thank but you we for need, saying that. But we need to work with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, need to, we, need to, we need to work together yeah. like any society does yeah. and heal some of the wounds that we have. And the new technologies are exciting, but you know, they sometimes even reinforce the challenges that we have. They give people the ability to say, well, maybe my, my discriminatory views are okay because so many other people have them and I, I can find a forum to push them out there. And so, in a way, the fact that we have new technologies is exciting, creates opportunities, but in and of itself, yeah. it's not going to address the fundamental issues of rights that we all are here to address. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Tambisa. Well, uh, women's and girls' rights are human rights and they should be universal, but let us not forget that we have to be as inclusive as possible in doing that. Thank you, Tambisa. That's a great. You know, just to, to, to conclude, I will give my own soundbite. I have been covering wars, unfortunately, across the world, from Congo, Sierra Leone, Afghanistan, Iraq. I have seen a lot in my life uh, from the front. And the only thing that comes to my mind when the suffering, when the bombs, when the explosions, when the killing, when the massacres take place, is that actually all that does not discriminate by, between men, women, children, girls, boys, or everyone. Societies could be destroyed when there is a mood of conflict, and then everything is destroyed. The interconnectedness between us is huge, you know. We might be focusing on something, and we should always focus on something, but I would advise always, from my background as a journalist, and now as someone who's, you know, doing some work across the world on this matter, that all of us should be seen as one in defending human values that everyone believes in, every sector, every gender, every level of age believes in. Because sometimes we are confronted with existential issues that do not allow anyone actually to progress or to create any serious change in life. So on one front, we are defending a cause which we stand for strongly, but Within that and above that, there is another multi-layer of us being part of this human community, which is trying to, to, to really come up with something more transcendental, more important, more radical in imagining a future for all of us. 
that could be peaceful, could achieve, you know, actual, you know, uh, life. I found people dying from lack of food in Somalia. I've seen them in front of my eyes. You know, I've seen them dying. No one can give them a drink to live. And I've seen how this kind of misery change the perspective of all humans. So we have a global struggle on much bigger scale, and we have global struggle on many other scales and agendas, and all of that convinced me that we should strive and struggle for one humanity which has great essence of believing that the future is for all of us, and unless all of us are free, none of us is going to be peacefully living a great future. Thank you very much. Thank you for the panel. And please, we can move. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Now, actually, we have the second panel on partnership. I welcome the panelists. Yeah, you're uh -huh. most welcome. Good to see you. Okay, so our second panel is going to discuss also again another issue, which is on partnership. And the idea is very simple. When we go out from a conference like this, we would, you know, take with us vision, which I think we have been talking about the whole conference, but we'll take with us also practical solutions and tools that we could share uh, with others and with our organizations to advance the cause of women and girls and at the same time to create, you know, serious international movement with partnership with everyone. I mean, this effort is definitely the heart of it is something we call partnership. And of course, Kathy, Kathy Calvin, you are the president and the CEO of the UN Foundation and you have been doing a lot of work in many fronts before that also in a media organization. And I think you have been developing this kind of concept of partnership because your organization is concerned about connecting people together to do something, a cause like that. From this front of women and girls and the organizations that are operating within the, this particular cause, how would you see the tools necessary to develop this kind of partnership and what levels of partnerships are we talking about? Well, thank you. It's a great question, and the panel before really reminded me that word connecting is at the root of what partnerships are about, and that's what we do. We connect people, ideas, and resources to the United Nations, but more importantly, we connect people together so that they together can help solve the big problems and feel like they are the change agents. So I love the phrase that young people use today, nothing about us without us, and I think that's kind of got to be the starting point. And we've got to move from a period of partnerships that were very transactional, one-to-one, -one, I'm together to, with you to solve one problem, to thinking about how partnerships are transformative. We have a partnership with Merck for Mothers, Merck MSD for Mothers, that I think is transformational because it's not treating just one aspect of a problem, or a woman, or a girl, but thinking about what empowers her to have control over her life. This one happens to be about contraception and family planning. But that's, I think, what's gonna make partnerships different in the future. We need to break out of just thinking about um, what you can do for me and I can do for you, but how together we're gonna make it change. So some of the solutions, I think, going forward as we go to this new, new frame of partnerships for the Sustainable Development Goals, rather than the Millennium Development Goals, will be that we'll think across the goals themselves. You know, they're so interrelated, we can't just think about them as one piece of a problem. We'll think across sectors. We'll think within sectors and how we can be stronger by bringing people together. And we'll acknowledge that partnerships are difficult. They are sort of unnatural acts by consenting adults where you have to align your objectives, you have to be willing to report and share, you have to be able to change midstream, and you have to be able to engage the people who you're trying to help and let them help design with you. So it's to me a very exciting time and doing it around women and girls issues is the most powerful because women and girls need to be the actors, not just the beneficiaries. Excellent, thank you very much, great. Uh, Dr. Naveen Rao, you are the uh, leader of 
Merck MSD for Mothers, and you have been doing a great job actually in that field, and of course you are communicating with many organizations in order to achieve the goals of, of the uh, organization. Now, in, in that particular regard, on the level of communication within organizations that are concerned uh, 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 or focusing on, on women and, and girls, do you see a sufficient level of partnership emerging to develop this kind of global movement? Or do you suggest a new track or a new way of thinking in order to achieve that partnership? Yes and no. <laughs> uh, truly. Um, so first of all, thank you. And it's always a pleasure to be to share the stage with uh, Kathy and with Venkat. I really appreciate that. Um, I lead MSD for Mothers, Merck for Mothers, and, and uh, it's a corporate responsibility project within Merck MSD, which was a $500 million commitment over 10 years to see, uh, to ensure that we can create a world where no woman dies during pregnancy or childbirth. So that was the, that was the holy grail, that was our objective, and that's what we set ourselves out to do in a non-commercial manner but quickly realize that there is no magic bullet for these kinds of issues. So when a mother dies, it's a systems failure, and by definition, it's a multifactorial problem. And to deal with a multifactorial problem, by definition, you need a multisectorial approach. If the problem is multifactorial, you need a multisectorial approach. And the multisectorial, in this instance, we need really the governments, the local governments, we need civil society, but we also need the private sector. And that no one sector can tackle these problems all in itself. So yes, partnerships are emerging in all three, but no, not consistently are we putting the girl and the woman in the middle, building systems around her that involve all three sectors with a commitment that we'll all work together to, 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 to take care of her. And unless we do that, unless we build holistic solutions with our woman-centered, we're going to fail. Because it's not enough that, for example, Merck, for, Merck MSD for Mothers says, we will take care of the health problems that lead to maternal mortality, postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia. Yeah? What about the nutrition? What about the education? What about a chance for, for economic um, empowerment, what about the culture at home? There's so many other issues that come, and so if isolated, I say I will take care of maternal mortality, and I'll do it with these set of solutions that I think I'm bringing with good intentions, it's not enough. We need to look at that girl, that woman as a whole, and build around her, and, uh, and the example that uh, Kathy talked about is a partnership that UN Foundation is doing with uh, MSD for Mothers. In the Philippines, we, we've d done a workplace program where we have realized that in a lot of these garment ma manufacturing companies, in places there are a lot of women in that age group that need sexual reproductive health and support. We're doing workplace programs to, to give them education products and, and to allow them to, to to value and choose when and where to have children and, 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 and give them the support they need. But this is not throwing fish. That traditional story we've all been told, this is about teaching them how to fish so that it's sustainable. And we also realize that to make this sustainable, we need for the, for the company that hires these women to want to continue to sustain this because there is something in it for them. When we showed, when we, we developed a return on investment tool, that's actually an algorithm and a tool that you could input number of days lost, productivity, and come up with a value for every dollar invested in this program, how the company is actually making money. Mm -hmm. And that kind of partnership with the woman in mind, where it's a win, win, win. Right now, it's a win for the woman, obviously, and it's a win for us because we want to achieve these goals, but it's a win for the company. Yeah. And that is what they're talking about. So just to summarize, it's the golden triangle that people talk about. And, and we read it now in everywhere, the golden triangle, at the top is the governments because unless the government 
is fully committed, this is not going to take traction. We can come and do what we want, but if it is not within the political uh, environment and it serves their purpose, it's gone. Civil society, absolutely necessary, and private sector is necessary to keep it a sustainable, okay. holistic model. So that's my piece. On, thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, Vijay, I think Vijay Anathan to Sandra. Now, you are from Sri Lanka. You are a youth advocate and activist who is involved in many activities. I've seen beautiful things that you are doing, not only in, in Sri Lanka and many other places. Are you, as an activist and a youth advocate, are you satisfied with the level of partnership or even understanding mm -hmm. that you know the elders have? be it politicians or even be it mature organizations, well-established organizations in, 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 in your experience in Sri Lanka and outside it. Right. So in terms of partnership, I just want to say like the technology also really plays with young people a big role. So like I always want to say that the technology is something like a sharp knife you can use for good things and bad things. So it's, it's always which, which the technology and the weapon in which hand, so we have to think. So in, in my work, like what we are doing is uh, challenging the, if it is in the technology with the uh, bad hands, like we have to challenge, the, challenge it when we building the partnership. So that is really, really important. So uh, very recently we uh, ran a campaign on sexual and reproductive health rights of disabled young people. So like for that we need, we need a lot of uh, partnership. I mean with government, uh, private sector and civil society. And especially uh, to push the agenda of it. So we, we have to work with different uh, politicians, we, we have to work with different uh, powerful celebrities. So we, we, we have to push that agenda in order to get that uh, push in that. So especially in terms of sec uh, sexual and reproductive health, the rights of disabled young people, uh, in, in Sri Lanka, uh, it's considered a very taboo subject. So a lot of people talks about uh, disabled young people's uh, right to education, uh, right, to, right, uh, right to income opportunities. But uh, we had a situation where uh, that uh, sexual reproductive health rights of disabled young people didn't recognize as an as essential issue. So like we have done a, a st stakeholder analysis and identified who are the people will be supporting as a partners for this program. And we also find out a lot of uh, celebrities who can support this initiative and who, uh, who, who are powerful in the local communities, who are powerful in the social network and the media. So we have, we found out they can influence that. They, they can uh, take this message to uh, different communities. So we, have a, we are having a really good impact on that. And now we are the organization like UNFPA and different organizations start to work on sexual and reproductive rights of disabled young people. So I see that as a really good partnership in the online platform. So, and also like we have to partner with uh, young people and we also train a lot of uh, young people on sexual and reproductive health. So we, in that, in that session, we have a special session on how do you deal uh, online, online, online related issues. Like if somebody putting out a statement on like g gender stereotypical statement, how do you tackle with that? So in, in some areas, in the local communities, he's not a celebrity, but in the local area, in the social network, he's really powerful. So we have to partner with them. We have to work with them to challenge it and change it. Okay, good. Now, actually, I would, you know, Kathy, I mean, I will go back to you about the designing the, the concept of partnership itself. You know, I would personally advise any organization that is operating on, on the rights and operating on the issues related to women and girls, and of course, many other issues, not to look at media as a tool. You know, I have been leading a network myself, and I've been always contacted by a lot of people who would like to advocate their message. When you feel that you are only a tool of communication, your excitement and enthusiasm to embrace 
that role is by far less than when you feel you are a partner of designing the message itself. So to find a message and to find partnership that brings people together and let them lead with you the message, that becomes actually a serious partnership. I know that you are doing this because I personally was invited by your organization one day to New York to design the message to the Arab youth, and, and that was a great experience for me. But what would you tell us about this particular concept of a serious partnership in order to develop the message itself, not only to be a tool of communication? Ah, oh, that's a great point. So I think one of the mistakes that people make when they build partnerships is they, they have an idea, they go out and shop it to find somebody who will fund it. That's, that's not going to work anymore. It has to be co-created. And the message is actually at the heart of a partnership. It has to be something that we commonly design, commonly believe in, and commonly feel we can talk about. And one of the things I love about Merck MSD's Mother, Merck for Mothers program is they were willing to take on advocacy as a tool. So it's not just the delivery piece. It's not just the transfer of skills or information, but it's actually trying to change policy. That's critical, because otherwise any of the work we do doesn't have sustainability. So we have to build sustainability in from the very beginning by having messaging that holds, messaging that can be evolving. And frankly, I love the idea of using media as a, as a partner, not just a tool, because the media today is so powerful and it's so so multifaceted, it's not top-down anymore, it's so designed by people themselves. So we have to make that part of our overall experience. And we also are seeing that the private sector is coming at this not from a charitable angle, the old traditional corporate social responsibility, it's much more core to their business, so they're building it into their core messaging about their purpose, their purpose is employers, their purpose is value chains, their purpose is giving giving support to a community. So all of this is about messaging and changing the way we talk about our common goals. And then I just have to say a word about the UN because I think the UN itself is, this is not your grandfather's UN. This is a UN that understands the problems of today's world and the changes that we're trying to to create can't be done by one sector, can't just be done by government. So we have to learn the language, as your previous panel was talking about, across sectors. And I think the private sector has been doing a great job. Frankly, I think the development sector needs to learn more of the private sector's language so that we can really communicate together. Excellent. Now, if, if we just in a quick would like to, you know, put some points for what are the criteria that we would advise in order to create partnerships, serious, solid partnerships. So, at least until now, I have two beautiful words. We have shared development of the message, and then we have the sustainability. Mm -hmm. And what else, Dr. Rao? What would you advise us from your own experience? You have been working not only with, with people who are concerned about women and girls, but you are working with all international organizations. So well, I'm going to flip it on its head. Um, first of all, I appreciate all your comments, Kathy, but I'm really going to flip uh, what you're saying. Would you be asking me all these if we were talking about my marriage? About? My marriage. I'm married 37 years. I'm in a partnership. <laughs> and would I go home to my wife and say, are we together in this, in creating the message? Are we only here to give the message? Are we here? What was the shared, shared value, something you put? I don't think I'd get breakfast if I started talking like this. <laughs> what makes partnerships work is the same thing what makes my marriage work. Respect, communication, joint agenda, trust. trust. <laughs> That's what's partnership. Just because we put this word public-private partnership, all of a sudden we get in words that Let's just go back to the human nature. I mean, it's all about trust, communication, and making sure you're in it and compromise and you know when to give in and what to take and how, where are we headed, which way is north. When you get that between organizations, it works just as well as a marriage. Only thing, of course, is we don't get into bed, but. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish. We are working on family planning. <laughs> if this is beautiful ideals, 
do exist in the public life. I wish if media, because I coming from a media, we are heavily commercialized by the yes. end of the day. And in order to create this kind of, you know, trust is beautiful and lovely and it's good to be between a man and his wife, definitely that's amazing and without it, it doesn't work. But uh, I do believe <laughs> eventually that I need in media sometimes something in your message that could also advance my cause. So it is a shared interest yeah. rather than me, you know, being your, uh, your yes. own advocate. So, so is my marriage and so is your marriage. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> hoping, is, yeah. I'm <laughs> hoping you're so lucky. But even you're smiling, so you get what I'm trying to say is we probably need to change the vocabulary back to human words that we know and understand and, and are beyond measure. When we say trust, there's no ruler for that and there's no return on investment. There is no shared value. All this exists. We know it intuitively. You look at nature. Yeah. This is beautiful. Lovely. <laughs> now, we go back to the youth. I mean, you are looking forward to something different in the future. Definitely. Every youth would like to see something different in the future. What would they like to see? How would you like to see us promoting, advocating, and spreading the message around? Right. So, I think a lot of young people even been... Um, in the name of partnership used as tokenistic way, like young people just, you know, just they put into the, into the, in, into the areas where like just tokenistic way, like, okay, you give a spot to young person to speak. So sometimes young people cannot communicate, they need a particular skill in order to communicate their issues and problems. So like it's not just uh, participation and meaningful involvement on young people need to be taken place. And also young people are moving really fast. Like if you take before 20 years, there is no way young people can um, learn many things. But young people are so fast and now even small kids, they are, they are learning really, really fast. So young people have a lot of knowledge and skills and, and they, they feel it. Especially when I always refer to social network because young people are doing so revolution in social network. Young, young people live in society because we have to remember that it's a society that we live in a social network. There are different characters, different people, so we have to identify who is influencing that. So we have to build the partnership, not only the offline and online, and also not only just clicktivism, and it need to translate into the activism. So a lot of people think liking a page, or like sharing a post, okay, I, I have done my job. It has to connect to the offline platform in order to take that message. So. The partnership, because in, in, in my work, what I do, sometimes we identify who are the really influential, influ, influential uh, celebrities or people in the community. And we try to partner with them because they push a lot of stereotypical ideas about women and gender, and especially a lot of sometimes very, it's not pro unproper messages. So they have already that power. We have to challenge it in order to work with them very closely and sensitize them. And we, we have success in this. Some, some medias and celebrities, when they put out like gender stereotypical messages, when we talk and sensitize them, they, they try to support our initiative. So, I mean, I, I see in the future level, uh, the online platform going to be taking power and ruling the society. Thank you. That's, I share the same vision with you as well. Now, the last thing I would like actually to clarify in a quick maybe, you know, around the questions is partnership is not only with civil society and organize, traditional organizations and other organizations and human rights organizations, also with governments because to a large extent a lot of what we do eventually boils down to authorities, especially in areas where the concept of civil society is not really very powerful or human rights in many parts of the world. So politicians, their eye will be on certain other interests, either their popularity or using this as a tool to advance this or to fight it even because it is a tool to, you know. So how would you, you know, describe this kind of, of issue of partnership with authorities? How could we manage to find our way through such complicated, diverse political entities across the world? Well, I, th I think this comes to a, a really critical um, word distinction here between partnership and partnerships. So we always kind of default to partnerships. You know, we're going to have a partnership 
And so we, we work on that piece of it. But it's, it's actually how are we thinking about working in partnership together on something. And I think that's where government comes in and clarity about the roles of each of the players. Mm -hmm. So we need governments to set the long, long vision, to clear some paths, to make sure everyone can be at the table. There are s critical roles for governments to play that businesses frankly can't play and civil society isn't always equipped to play. But then the, the roles of everybody need to, need to be defined and designed so that everybody understands what they're bringing to the table. And that's why we do partnerships because no one of us in, in our sectors has all the answers or all the tools or all the solutions, frankly. I'm really interested in seeing the partnerships now between, between businesses and within sectors where they're saying, if government isn't going to be able to set the right change of policy on how we use uh, products in, or create products from declining resources, we're going to take it on together because that's the only way we can make a change. So in the consumer products sector, they're really dealing with palm oil and other things. That's where we also see really big po policy changes taking place and governments coming from behind. But then the government can ratify. Excellent. Dr. Rao? Yeah, so I completely agree, and there's not much to add from what Kathy's saying. I think she nailed it. Um, the only thing I'd add is unless we understand that government is made up of people and people who have the same needs, wants as individuals, but collectively they're responsible for the nation, unless we feed into what is in it for them and how do we work with them to advance what they want, and link into that and make sure our objectives link in with the government's objectives. Because if we go in with an us versus them, it'll never work. We'll never be able to get traction. So it's like anything else, just understanding what the needs are and make sure our, our objectives are aligned with the larger objective. Because without political will, there is no, no sustainability. In your case, of course, you know, I would assume that the, the cause of Merck for Mothers is embraced by governments because there is no need for them to fight back against it. But in other activities that some of us might be trying to achieve, it would contradict certain well-established values or even regulations or laws. And therefore, the, the, the issue becomes a little bit much more sensitive. And the relationship with governments here is not only the governments see in us an opportunity, but also could see a threat. And therefore, how would we manage this kind of relationship? So we need to change the language and we need to talk on, as Jill Sheffield said years ago, uh, saving our mothers is, is not just the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. How do, we, how do we convince the government and the policy makers and the people who are responsible to understand the value of saving a mother? Uh, maternal mortality, as you said, is an easy one because everyone gets it and nobody wants it. But to save a mother, you need a system. It's a system failure when a mother dies. And so how do we get all the pieces correct? And some of them are sensitive pieces that are about religion, that are about sex, that are about gender equality, that are, you know, there's a lot that goes around. So we need to make sure that we talk the language that the government understands and whether it be what is the value of the woman and how much of the GDP is run, is, is you know, one third of the country's GDP is run by the woman. How do we make sure there's an economic model? We just don't go make this a moral case and constantly expect governments to change because they have civils, you know, they have a lot of other responsibilities. How do we, how do we elevate this so that we're talking in parity with everything else that comes on their table? So if they have to do defense, they talk a language on how much they need to spend on defense, how much they need to spend on infrastructure. And then when it comes to ours, we suddenly talk about morality and, and religion. Let's just make it on par so that it make it easier for the governments to decide. We need to upgrade our language and talk yeah. their language. So I really feel it's up to us now. This is very useful. I think this is an uh, excellent way. Um, uh, Vijay, I would like you know you to comment on what you have started, also to link it to the topic. You spoke about civil society, you spoke about partnerships, but also you spoke about internet and the usage of social networks. 
what a scary recipe you are giving to the youth in some parts of the world, really. This is what takes them to jail in most of the countries where I have come from, by the way. <laughs> you know, the Arab Spring started because of the social networks, and now you are encouraging this kind of communication. A lot of these guys ended in jail, not only those who call for political freedom, mm -hmm. even those who participate in any activity called civil society. Mm -hmm. So. It doesn't look very promising in certain countries, especially where authoritarian regimes are still holding to power. So what kind of partnership, again, are we going right. to develop? Would you advise young people to develop partnerships with human rights organizations, with activists across the world, to be protected when they are led to jail or being banned from practicing their activities? Right. So like, I also like to build on the example they gave because in Sri Lanka, like we advocate for advocate for comprehensive sexuality education. So like when you talk about like organization like human rights organization or government, or like civil society, you are not talking about one entity. You are talking about the people also inside. So all the people inside the organization do not think in a similar way. So like I also believe like when we push for comprehensive sexuality education, when we find out, do a mapping, so who are the people are barrier to implement sexual and reproductive health comprehensive sexuality education? So we also find out like religious organization, like who can support, there are positive allies who can support. We have to identify who are the people can oppose that. So like we need to stop thinking like a one entity as this organization, we have to find out inside of it who can support, mm -hmm. who, who, can, who can, again, so like what kind of measure we can take and having a very genuine conversation about that, so that, that we have to do. That's great. Now, again, we will end with sound bites. By the way, the concept of sound bite in media, as I have learned it, it is from 20 to 30, 40 seconds of something that fits within the, the, the report that we normally used to make as reporters. Now, a sound bite that summarizes your vision for partnership. We'll start with you, Kathy. Okay. So I think it starts with data. Without good data, we can't have good equality. It takes trust among partners, and it takes an outcome that we all believe in. Excellent. So data is beautiful. To start with, Dr. Rao. By the way, sound bite, I think, is spelled with a B Y T E. <laughs> sound bite. bite. Yeah. When it first came out, it was spelled B-Y-T-E. The, the byte, not uh, <laughs> byte, but yeah. uh, the computer byte. Yeah, yeah. So it, what fits in a byte no, of speak a... speak about the byte. Yeah, the no, way. it's actually what fits yeah. in the byte of a computer <laughs> algorithm. Yeah. But anyway, to me, partnerships only work if there's clarity of purpose and there is uh, agreement that we have shared goals. Excellent. Vijay? For me, it's partnership about we as we, what we can do together, genuine cause of it, and being honest about that and what we are going to achieve. So we feeling it's partnership. So Kathy, would you agree that we are the present and the past and he's the future? <laughs> Sadly. I'm the, I'm the past, you're the present, no, he's the future. No. <laughs> Actually, I would also, you know, conclude by saying, you know, again, going back to reality, you know, we have gone through a lot of difficulties in the Middle East when we were going through something called the Arab Spring, if you remember a few years ago. But we discovered something interesting. We discovered that what we thought is, you know, a great discovery in our experience is not really as new as we, you know, might have imagined. Uh, we faced, I mean, especially the young youth who have been advocating rights and trying to go out and use new technology and connect with each other and develop new values that are not traditional, but uh, value-centered, uh, non-ideological, non-religious, and going forward, uh, they faced, of course, a huge challenges in politics and economics and, and partnerships and many other things. But we found, for example, the Latin Americans have gone through 20 years ago, you know, on the issue of a transformation from military dictatorship to, uh, to, uh, to democracy. We have seen in South Africa, for example, from 1994, a transformation through truth and reconciliation. Uh, we thought that we are the first age, you know, to face this. And it came to my mind that a sense of global partnership 
will enrich our experience beyond imagination and shorten the time that enables us to achieve our target. So we do not repeat ourselves and fill in the trap that we are the first to do it, and therefore we have to invent. Actually, we can build on others' experiences and nurture it and develop it into a higher level rather than to start a fresh start and a new cycle. I think, you know, with that, we are coming to an end of this magnificent panel. It is the second panel on partnership, and I think it connects very well with the first panel on the future. So thank you very much for that. Now I would like to call uh, to the panel Mr. Darren Walker. Darren Walker is the president of Ford Foundation to present a new award for a Woman Deliver Award. Thank you very much. And Darren can come, please. You are there. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is great to be with you. And on this occasion, we're here to honor a remarkable woman a woman we adore and admire, who we are passionate about. Her name is Cecile Richards, and we this morning will award this inimitable woman with the Women Deliver Courage Award. The poet Maya Angelou once said, quote, without courage, we cannot practice any other virtue with consistency. And for the last decade, no one has been more courageous and more consistent, a more passionate voice for women than Cecile Richards. Cecile, whether you're fighting to expand access to essential health care on behalf of millions of Planned Parenthood patients, or standing up for women over four hours, four hours of a contentious Senate hearing. You make us proud. And while it is true, in the United States, we've watched as our politics sinks to new lows. But Cecile Richards reminds us that it's still possible to aspire, to have ambition and determination to ensure women's health, women's reproductive rights, the rights to sex education. And throughout Cecile's career, she has been a model for young women and men who seek to stand up for women's rights in particular and social justice more broadly. And of course, I'm a little biased because we're all Texas friends. And I was a great admirer of Cecile's sensational, remarkable mother, Ann Richards. And for the last six years, I've been privileged to have her serve as a trustee of the Ford Foundation. Because Cecile understands that the work of the Ford Foundation on inequality places women at the center, and in fact, it has been Cecile's influence on the Ford Board that has helped us to ensure that women are at the center. We understand that inequality has many forms. It's not just economic inequality or equal pay, which we know so well, but also equal access to essential services control, full control over the bodies of women, equal opportunity and an equal voice in decisions that affect the lives of women. So Cecile, in addition to her tireless advocacy for women in my own life, in the lives of so many women 
and men around the world, Cecile Richards has had a profound impact. And for your continued leadership, my dear Cecile, on the front lines of social change and social justice around the world, today I am honored, privileged to present you with this year's Women Deliver Award for Courage. Please welcome Cecile Richards. Well, thank you, Darren. Um, I just want to say two things. One, I just want to really uh, say thank you to the Ford Foundation for focusing on inequality. It is very exciting to have Darren's leadership and, and this foundation uh, really attack, I think, some of the root causes of inequality around the globe. Uh, and I'm honored to be here um, at Women Deliver on behalf of Planned Parenthood, and I just want to say thank you. Uh, to Women Deliver and to all of you here on behalf of the thousands of volunteers and clinicians and doctors uh, and staff who for a hundred years have, have run and built Planned Parenthood. Uh, and on behalf of all of us, thank you for standing with women and women's ability to have full reproductive rights and justice, uh, not only in the United States, but around the globe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cecil Richards. This is actually a great occasion.